By the last decades of the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution had remade whole economies. Steam power and steel were making machines, and the machines were making goods, at a rate and on a scale the world had never seen before. No sector of industry had been left untouched by the revolution. But personal life, the way that people went about their daily business, was rather old-fashioned in comparison. Except for taking a train ride or buying factory-made goods, the majority of people lived much as they had for centuries. People still got around mostly on foot or horseback, or, if they were wealthy, in carriages. Merchandise went around town and out to the country in wagons, without a steam engine in sight. Farmers plowed with oxen and hauled their crops to market in horse-drawn carts. There were some attempts to harness steam power for local transport off the railways, but none of them really took off. That was because steam power, mighty as it was, didn't really scale down. Though good at running factories and steamships and locomotives, it simply didn't make sense for personal small-scale transportation or for going to remote areas. Even the smallest portable steam engines could only be put on a vehicle that was about the same size as a carriage, but cost more, wasn't nearly as reliable, and besides that was dirty and clunky to handle, thanks to the coal, which was not the ideal fuel for personal use. Imagine yourself trying to drive a coal-powered car. After you preheated the engine for a quarter of an hour to raise steam, you could be off and rolling, with one hand for steering, one hand for shifting gears, and presumably a third hand for stoking the engine. You get the idea. Coal was cumbersome and time-consuming to handle, difficult to move around in consistent small batches for a constant engine pressure, and no matter how careful you were, handling it left machines and people coated in a highly flammable black dust. Without good ventilation and cleaning, this soot could turn any machine space into an unintended large fuel air bomb. In a big locomotive or a steamship, there were ways to handle all that. Hire a couple of full-time stokers, separate the coal bunkers and the engine space from the passengers, and build the boilers heavy enough to withstand high steam pressures. But those weren't options that scaled down to the personal car operated by one driver. Thus, transportation in the late 1800s could be powerful only when it was large. Away from shipping and railway lines, people and goods moved from A to B in much the same way that they had been moving for thousands upon thousands of years. Not that there wasn't anybody trying to bring the Industrial Revolution to transport. Prototype steam cars had been clanking over the cobbled roads of European cities since at least the 1700s, and the more optimistic inventors kept diligently trying to find ways to make them popular. Early on, they had pinpointed coal as the source of the problem, and sought ways to make engines smaller and unblemished by soot. In the early years of the 19th century, two French brothers settled on a design that reduced the size and weight of the engine by eliminating the water boiling step and, with it, the boiler. Instead, their prototype channeled expanding gases straight from the burning fuel right into the piston cylinder, using them instead of steam to push the pistons up and down. This newfangled internal combustion engine, first successfully run in 1807, was fueled by a fine powder made by grinding club moss spores. It's not clear how many spores to the mile their engine required, nor whether the recorded 12 to 13 explosions per minute referred to the fuel combustion rate or to the number of allergic sneeze reactions it generated. The brothers had slightly better success by mixing up a new fuel consisting of one part resin to nine parts ground coal. But it still took multiple operators to handle, and inconsistencies in the composition of the fuel led to frequent damaging variations in the engine pressure and the combustion rate. Engines occasionally exploded. The horse and wagon continued to be the mainstay of land transport for decades longer. What changed it all were two things, a waste product that kept fouling the wells of a Pennsylvania brine-pumping entrepreneur, 
and the American Civil War. Since 1838, the brine wells owned by Samuel Martin Keir and his father had been getting contaminated by a thick black goop that kept coming up from the rocks and getting into the pumps. This was a routine problem in the area, and at first Keir had simply followed the common neighborhood practice of skimming the goop off his brine and dumping it in a neighboring canal either because of the sheer volume of the stuff or because the canal caught fire, Cure had to stop dumping and figure out some other way to get rid of the waste. In keeping with the spirit of the times, he gave it the classical name for oily stuff that came out of rocks and started marketing Cure's genuine petroleum as a patent medicine, recommended as nature's own cure for everything from pimples to cholera. That sold well at first, but by the late 1840s, the novelty of drinking crude oil for one's health appeared to be wearing off, and Keir had to find another way to get people to pay money for a waste product of brine. By then, the Europeans were starting to distill coal and tar to produce various types of lubricating oils, paraffin, and asphalt, and it's probable that Keir was aware of their experiments. Though modern petroleum geochemistry was a ways in the future, he figured that his black contaminating goop had to be something pretty similar to coal and tar, since it too was black, flammable, stank of sulfur when burned, and left a sooty, obviously carbonaceous residue everywhere. So Keir hired a local iron worker to make him a cast iron one and a half barrel test still, and started trying to distill some samples of his patent medicine into something else of a saleable nature. The successful result, first produced in 1854, was a new carbon oil that burned as hot and bright as the black, goopy crude oil had, but with a clear flame that gave off little smoke and no smell and left no residue. The same year, a chemist and geologist named Abraham Gesner distilled the same carbon oil from natural tar and patented it as a lamp oil under the name kerosene. This proved about a syllable too long for marketing, and the name was quickly shortened down to kerosene. By the end of the 1850s, distillation plants had sprung up all over Pennsylvania. Most distilled kerosene out of coal and tar, but Keir's own refinery was dedicated to turning his well-contaminating black goop into kerosene at a whopping five barrels a day. Keir's use of petroleum to produce kerosene may have been unconventional, but it dawned on some other businessmen that it might just be cheaper than starting with coal. After all, petroleum was a liquid, and it welled up out of the ground on its own all over Pennsylvania. It didn't have to be mined, loaded, hauled, and broken into even chunks. All that was needed was a system that could gather up lots of the liquid oil as fast as the competition was mining coal. A Connecticut-based startup decided to devote full-time staff to the problem. Pretty soon, Edwin Drake, one-time clerk now employed by the Seneca Oil Company, was hiking around the area of Titusville, Pennsylvania, trying to work out ways to mine liquid petroleum at a large scale. Drake had zero experience with petroleum and no background in science or engineering, but he made a careful study of how producers got other liquids out of the ground, particularly water and brine wells. Since his target was also a liquid, he figured that if he could drill a hole in rocks containing petroleum, it should start flowing in just as water did in a well. In theory, that was great, but as Drake soon found, reality beats theory. In this case, the reality was that most of his early holes hit nothing but water. Sometimes traces of oil would show up, enough to tantalize, but not enough to refine. And the water flow was destabilizing the drill holes. Water flowed in fast enough that the rock around the sides of the borings would crumble, choking the drill machinery with wet sand. Locals around Titusville started calling his numerous operations Drake's Folly. The company that had hired him yanked funding. Drake borrowed money and kept going. Slowly and methodically, he began changing his drilling methods to get better results. 
Instead of simply putting a drill bit down and starting it turning, he equipped the drill bit with a pipe-like iron casing that held the hole open against the crumbling rock around the sides, no matter how much water tried to rush in. This casing stayed in place while the drill bit proceeded downward, periodically being hauled back up to the surface to add the next piece of casing. Foot by slow foot, Drake's holes got deeper, and now they stayed open. In late August of 1859, right as his borrowed money was about to run out, hard work and ingenuity paid off. Drake's drilling crew came out to the borehole they'd left at a depth of 69 feet the previous day. Overnight, it had filled up with oil, which that morning was bobbing around within sight of the top of the hole. Drake was done drilling. Now, he started pumping oil into any container he could find, which included every whiskey barrel in town, presumably after the drilling crew had drained them in celebration. And even the most skeptical were convinced that his method worked. More than that, they wanted to try it themselves. The population of Titusville doubled within a few months, and oil wells sprang up by the dozen. Pennsylvania's refineries began producing kerosene from crude oil instead of coal. For the first year or two, the oil producers had an uphill struggle to convince the American people to burn kerosene in their lamps and lanterns. The wealthy were accustomed to whale oil, which burned with a bright, clean, odorless flame, but which cost about $2 per gallon, or about $75 per gallon today. Most people couldn't afford that, so they had gotten used to something called burning fluid or camphene, which was camphor oil dissolved in turpentine and ethanol, and it cost about a quarter of what whale oil did. Kerosene distilled from crude oil was as cheap as camphene, but it wasn't what the public was used to, and without a cost advantage, it could only nibble at the market share. That changed abruptly in April of 1861 when the American Civil War broke out. Around 97% of American turpentine came from the forests of North Carolina, which had just joined the Confederacy, and which was not about to sell wartime supplies to the other side. What little turpentine the Union had was reserved for the Navy. One of the three major ingredients in burning fluid had become virtually unobtainable overnight. And in case that wasn't enough, Congress decided to fund the Union war effort by taxing alcohol, which included the other main solvent in camphene, ethanol. In 1862, its price doubled. By the end of the war, it was up more than tenfold. Congress had floated a revenue-generating tax on kerosene, too, but Pennsylvania's congressional delegation had united to spike the idea. That left kerosene, refined from liquid petroleum, as by far the cheapest source of illumination on the market. Total production of crude oil across the entire state had totaled about 4,500 barrels in 1859. By 1862, it was over 3 million barrels, and Pennsylvanian kerosene was lighting the nation. It wasn't long before chemists and businessmen realized there was more to get out of oil than just the kerosene. Natural petroleum consists of many different types, called fractions, of bonded hydrogen and carbon atoms, shaped like chains of various lengths. Kerosene is one of the medium-sized fractions, made up of chains 10 to 16 carbon atoms long. Gasoline, another fraction, has chains ranging from 4 to 12 carbons long, averaging octane, so-called for its 8-carbon string. At the other end of the scale, asphalt and bitumen are long molecules with more than 50 carbon atoms per chain. The problem, of course, is that in crude oil, all these different fractions are mixed together. The easiest way to separate them is by temperature since long-chain heavy hydrocarbons remain liquid at temperatures that would cause the shorter, lighter ones to boil. Here and the other early distillers had focused exclusively on getting everything into the right temperature window to extract kerosene. They had dumped everything else, meaning the vast majority of the crude oil they just pumped. 
but in the 1870s, the popularization of a new continuous distillation apparatus enabled refineries to start recovering all the different hydrocarbon fractions by varying the temperatures throughout a high tower. Light molecules, like gasoline and naphtha, would boil off between about 75 and 200 degrees Celsius and make their way into the condenser, while the heavier, long-chain hydrocarbons still sat in the bottom of the tower. Thus arrived mass-produced gasoline, just in time to meet George Brayton, an American engineer working in the 1870s and 80s. Brayton had been experimenting with the internal combustion engine, patenting a series of so-called constant pressure engines that, as the name implies, were able to maintain a steady gas pressure at a level that didn't cause them to explode. Brayton promptly seized on gasoline and similar fractions of hydrocarbons as a fuel with the necessary high and consistent energy output. And being a liquid, these could also be automatically added to an engine at a steady rate by his other new invention, the fuel injector. He also discovered how to atomize the heavier types of oil for use in still more efficient engines, although it was Rudolf Diesel who, in the next decade, would give his name to both the engine and the hydrocarbon fraction that ran it. Thomas Edison and the electric light gradually ate the kerosene market away to almost nothing over the next few decades. But by then, kerosene was no longer the most sought-after type of petroleum, nor was nighttime illumination the main use. The automobiles beginning to replace horses and carriages required gasoline as a fuel. With them, the Industrial Revolution finally reached deep into everyday life. Coal could not have powered the revolution in personal transportation that continues to make our world and our habits what they are today, with cars and airplanes running on hydrocarbons taking us where we want to go. Where coal had fired the revolution in industry and manufacturing through the 18th and 19th centuries, the 20th century would be the century of oil. And the 21st, so far, has been almost three quarters powered by the oil and natural gas that first began lighting the world almost 170 years ago.